Narek Verdian. Please, Narek, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Um, good morning, Zervis. Um, my Deutsch is sehr schlecht, but there were some things that I, um, like three things I picked up from the earlier conversations, which one was culture. Culture eats everything for breakfast, you know, for every breakfast, dinner, um, lunch, and everything. Um, second one was security. It's super relevant. Doesn't matter where you work, security, front of mind, not only application security, but also. Um, telling everyone in a company how to behave, but also the make it personal aspect, right? And when I first sp um, when I first started looking at you know getting ready for the conference here, um, first I thought so good going back face to face. <laughs> I think this is the first time I'm going to an event face to face in two years, and it's incredibly privileged um, to be here. Um, but also hello to everyone joining us remotely. You know, thinking about making it personal, I decided to make this very informal and from the view of myself as a child. I um, had the chance to learn software engineering or programming when I was six or seven. It was my dad's, my father's hobby, and yes, he would write lots of kind of programming code, listings of code in basic, but then he would get me to type it. And that's, why, that's how I got into it. And it's incredibly rewarding because you write a little code, you compile it, you publish it, and then you see the outcome. As an engineer, it's so rewarding, and it's truly privileged to do something like that. And then later, I got into uh, developing products. Very early in my career, I was 17 when I started working in this German company called Lycos Europe, um, developing products uh, for mass consumption. And then it turned into a passion of building teams that deliver amazing products. It's tr truly incredi incredible when we think about the fact, and I very much sometimes retreat and think about in a context of having seven billion plus people on our planet, and this is not scientific. I know I'm in Zurich, and uh, I want to say this is not peer reviewed. This is just kind of some Google research. But when, when you put it in the context of seven billion plus population in our world, people involved with software engineering product development, tech, UX, all together in the world make up less than 0.05% of the population, right? It puts that in the context of social responsibility. Everything we do, building products, we're impacting lives, we're shaping up the future of our planet. And this is something that I keep coming back to when I speak to my team. I run a team of 450 people um, working for Globo. And one thing we discussed together with the team the other day was <clears throat> we are living in some incredible times right now of change. Every day there is you know, a new advancement in space, um, in genomics, in everywhere. But when I look back, again, not scientific, <laughs> not peer reviewed, but the first uh, remains of anatomically modern humans are said to be found from like 200,000 years ago. And then fast forward to when the first wheel was invented. I think the scientists say it's about 5,500 years ago, right? And if you think about that, humanity went about 195,000 years of evolution before we invented the wheel. It's like 99% of humanity's lifetime. But then everything accelerated, you know, from the wheel to transistor, from transistor to computer, from computers to every day now seeing new capsules going into space, taking civilians. How amazing was it seeing, you know, inspiration for, for civilians going into space? Drones everywhere, from drones helping winemakers harvest grape at the right time to drones sending defibrillators to deliveries. We are really living in an amazing, amazing time. Amazing time where we have reusable rockets. You know, I'm incred incredibly privileged and humbled to be working for a company that is changing lives everywhere. It's creating a lot of shared value in the markets we operate. Glovo is a Spanish startup that was found, uh, founded in 2015. Um, and it 
really lets in the countries, in the cities that we operate, customers to order anything they want. Yes, we do meals, food, fruits, vegetables, groceries, gifts, flowers. Um, but what we also do is manage a three-sided marketplace. And, you know, first our priority is to make sure that customers, partners, and couriers are given an amazing customer experience. This is done through the means of apps, you know, through iOS, Android, but also through web. So anytime, whether you are in an amazing, you have an amazing Wi-Fi or low connection, we always keep making sure that we provide the best experience possible. But then we have a lot of partners. We have partners you know, from the McDonald's of the world, KFCs all the way to local unique boutique restaurants, to, to groceries. And then we have couriers. But then the complexity comes from bringing it all together. Right? That's what creates network effects. You know, customers bring more customers. More selection brings more customers. More partners see that they can sell more. And that really creates the, the key complexity for us as a platform. You know, the um, arrival of COVID really was something that pushed us into overdrive. Obviously, with cities and countries in, in lockdown, the impact of COVID on, on platforms like ours was tremendous. It was literally overnight in two weeks. There was more customers, more partners, uh, more couriers, because many people were left out of work. The only thing they could do is do deliveries. But what that drove into is many com com competitors. Every week, I joined Globe about seven, seven months ago as um, CTO, but every week now there is a new competitor to us. Because COVID changed the landscape, people are more familiar with ordering things, and the competition really is going through the roof. So we keep thinking about how do you win long term in a, in a competitive landscape like this. I spent a decade in travel, in travel companies working for Expedia Group and Hotels.com. You know, for, for the last decade, Expedia, Booking.com, Airbnb, Hotels.com, and others have been in a fierce competition in getting customers to book hotels, flights, experiences on their platforms. And when I say fierce competition, Expedia every year would pay between $1 to $2 billion to Google for customer acquisitions. That's a tremendous amount of money, and there was a battle between every single brand out there, how to make it more efficient, how to spend the marketing money more, more efficiently. And that drove to, first, building a lot of marketing platforms, using machine learning, data, data science, be, building models that predict the pr propensity to buy of each customer. But secondly, that drove into this world of urgency messages. You know, if you open booking.com right now, it will be only one room is left. You know, if you look at that, last chance to, be, <laughs> to, to buy this. This is the, you know, this hotel is in high demand. Or this customer is looking at this hotel, right? This in my book is forgetting about what matters. Right? This is driving a lot of short-term wins. But then in the grand scheme of things, in the long term, you that the company really starts alienating the customer. Because instead of providing personalized experiences, they show me something that matters. You know, right now, if I use one of these platforms and I travel for work, I book once a month or twice a month, it's very rare for me to go back to one of these platforms and for them to recommend a hotel to me that I would really book. Even though they know my behavioral patterns, they know where I want to stay, it's very rare to see that behavior. And I think that's what's going to win in the future. How do we go there? First, it's easy access to data. You know, I was reading a few weeks ago about the fact um, that I believe somewhat, somewhat around 22nd of January was when the uh, genetic sequence of COVID-19 was published by the Chinese scientists. And then a month later, Moderna had the, sent the first batch of um, vaccines to be, to be tested. That's about one month from the idea to, to mass production. And then I was reading about what made it possible. 
and everything there points to having easy, ubiquitous access to data. You know, obviously, you don't want scientists to be focused on dealing with data, writing a lot of sheets and moving things around. And what Moderna truly really managed to achieve is having any member of the community having easy access to the latest data very quickly. And that's really what's going to win in the future. It's, the future is for companies who have access to knowledge, access to data, ver and access to, when I say data, trusted data, not just, you know, databases bundled together and put out there. It's where you can have access to reliable, trust, trust, trusted data. Secondly, it's experimentation culture. It's moving away from thinking for three to six months, especially in companies like us, what to do, but instead doing a lot of um, what we call A-B tests or multivariant tests, tri trialing lots of different things in the marketplace and see what might work. This could be very small experiments, just get letting in, um, running something in a one, one city. We operate in 26 different markets, I believe, um, as of today, but we run experiments hyper-localized in different markets to see what might work, what might consumers find useful in different markets. And lastly, it's API-first strategy. Why API-first? I think there's all the examples out there from Amazon to Made to One in China to Ali, AliExpress, uh, Alipay. APIs let you build modu modular architecture where you can plug things together very quickly. You avoid having monoliths slowing down your engineering capacity. Which leads you to focus less on commodities and utilities. You know, what we always think about is how do we make sure that we focus our engineers? Engineers' time is valuable. Right now, out there is a real, real forgive me for saying this, but it's a real battle for software engineers in the market. Every year, I read this uh, metric the other day, every year in the United States, one million software engineering vacancies go unfilled. So once we have software engineers, once you have software engineers, we have to make sure that we really focus on this side, focusing on making experiences that customers value, and also focusing on improving developer productivity. If we have some things in our processes, in our companies, in tech, that take engineers, you know, building the tools take five to 10 minutes, half an hour, they do it very frequently, that's creating an environment where essentially they, sp they, they waste their time. So our focus has to be there, and focus has to be what makes us unique. If the company's focus isn't payments or fintech, why build our own payment solutions? If our focus isn't um, HR databases, why building our own? So I think the future is focusing on what, as a company, do you provide to customers that is truly unique? At Global, like I said, we operate in 26 markets, um, including many African, um, African countries. And it's truly inspirational when, when I look at how much shared value we created a lot of these communities. I was reading some tweets the other day of customers um, saying how in a standstill city of Accra, they can get access to everything. They can get access to food, flowers, they can get access to you know, uh, barbers getting into their home to, to cut their hair. But also I was reading about some partners, some um, small to medium businesses that had absolutely no access to digitalization before. We go there, we speak to them, we plug them into our platform, we give them the handset, and then from then onwards, half an hour later, they can, they can sell on our platform, and they have access to literally the entire city population. And this is all through that API-first mindset, being there, out there, being able to integrate with everything possible. There was a case recently in one of our countries that we operate in where this woman, she had this little restaurant, I believe it was in, in one of the countries we operate in, uh, in Africa. Um, she would make and sell about 10 to 15 meals every day. By plugging her restaurant onto our platform, a few weeks later she started producing about you know, 10 
15 times more. And she had to invest more in bringing more people, employing more people, because the platform provided her access, access to much bigger uh, community. So in these markets, what we focus on is using our platform, the extensible capability to plug into local payment methods, plug into um, local APIs that lead us to delivering differentiated and hyper-localized products. And we continuously experiment. T today, we might, sell, we might try out selling tickets in one market. It works, we keep it. If not, then we move on to trying something different. And when I think about our platform, there's no one size fits all in this concept. We operate in all these markets. And in all the markets, when you open the app, you will see something different. And that's, I think, where the future is. The future is having access to knowledge, vast amounts of knowledge. You know, many companies go on to M&A sprees, uh, buying companies left, right, and center. That's all bringing all the data together and being able to make decisions very fast. And that's where I leave it. Thank you.